The Great Roman Civil War. Caesar's Civil War, 4945 BCE, was one of the last politico-military conflicts of the Roman Republic before its reorganization into the Roman Empire. It began as a series of political and military confrontations between Gaius Julius Caesar and Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus. Before the war, Caesar had led an invasion of Gaul for almost 10 years. The buildup of tensions started in late 49 BCE, and both Caesar and Pompey refused to back down. This led to the outbreak of civil war. Eventually, Pompey and his allies forced the Senate to demand that Caesar give up his provinces and armies. Caesar refused and marched on Rome. The war lasted four years and was fought in Italy, Illyria, Greece, Egypt, Africa, and Hispania. Pompey defeated Caesar in 48 BCE at the Battle of Dyrrhachium, but was himself defeated decisively at the Battle of Pharsalus. Many former Pompeians, including Marcus Junius Brutus and Cicero, surrendered after the battle. Others, such as Cato the Younger and Metellus Scipio, fought on. Pompey fled to Egypt, where he was assassinated on arrival. Others, such as Cato the Younger and Metellus Scipio, fought on. Pompey fled to Egypt, where he was assassinated on arrival. Caesar intervened in Africa and Asia Minor before attacking North Africa, where he soundly defeated Scipio in 46 BCE at the Battle of Thapsus. Scipio and Cato committed suicide shortly thereafter. The following year, Caesar decisively defeated the last of the Pompeians under his former lieutenant Labienus in the Battle of Munda. In 44 BCE, he was made dictator perpetuo, dictator in perpetuity or dictator for life, and assassinated shortly thereafter. Prologue Crassus's departure from Rome at the end of 55 BCE and his death in battle in 53 BCE marked the beginning of the end for the first triumvirate. With the deaths of Crassus and Julia, Caesar's daughter and Pompey's wife, in 54 BCE, the balance of power between Pompey and Caesar collapsed. It was inevitable that a face-off between them would occur. From 61 BCE, the main political fault line in Rome was counterbalancing against the influence of Pompey. This led him to seek allies outside the core senatorial aristocracy, namely Crassus and Caesar. However, the rise of anarchic political violence from 5552 BCE forced the Senate to ally with Pompey to restore order. The breakdown of order in 53 and 52 BCE was extremely disturbing. Men like Publius Clodius Pulcher and Titus Annius Milo were essentially independent agents, leading large violent street gangs in a highly volatile political environment. This led to Pompey's sole consulship in 52 BCE, during which he took sole control of the city without convening an electoral assembly. Caesar's decision to go to war was driven by the realization that he would be prosecuted for legal irregularities during his consulship in 59 BCE and violations of various laws passed by Pompey in the late 50s. The consequence of this would be ignominious exile. Caesar fought the civil war because he wanted a second consulship and triumph. If he had failed to attain these, his political future would have been jeopardized. Furthermore, the war in 49 BCE was to Caesar's advantage. He had continued military preparations while Pompey and the Republicans had barely started. Even in ancient times, the causes of the war were a mystery. There were no clear motives to be found. There were various pretexts, such as Caesar's claim that he was defending the rights of tribunes after they fled the city, which was too obvious a sham. Senatus Consultum Ultimum For the months leading up to 49 BCE, both Caesar and the anti-Caesarians, including Pompey, Cato, and others, were convinced that the other would back down or, failing that, offer acceptable terms. Over the last few years, trust had eroded between the two. Repeated cycles of brinksmanship harmed chances for compromise. On 1st January 49th BCE, Caesar stated that he would be willing to resign if other commanders would also do so. However, in Gruen's words, 
he would not endure any disparity in their Tsar and Pompey's forces. This appeared to be a threat of war if his terms were not met. Caesar's representatives in the city met with senatorial leaders with a more conciliatory message. Caesar was willing to give up Transalpine Gaul if he would be permitted to keep two legions and the right to stand for consul without giving up his imperium and thus right to triumph. However, these terms were rejected by Cato, who declared he would not agree to anything unless it was presented publicly before the Senate. On the eve of war, 7 January 49 BCE, the Senate was persuaded to demand that Caesar either give up his post or be judged an enemy of the state, despite Pompey and Caesar continuing to muster troops. A few days later, the Senate also stripped Caesar of his permission to stand for election in absentia and appointed a successor to Caesar's proconsulship in Gaul. Pro-Caesarian tribunes vetoed these proposals, but the Senate ignored them and moved the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, empowering the magistrates to take whatever actions were necessary to ensure the safety of the state. In response, a number of pro-Caesarian tribunes fled the city for Caesar's camp, dramatizing their plight. Crossing the Rubicon, Alea Iacta Est, Crossing the Rubicon. Caesar was appointed governor of a region that ranged from southern Gaul to Illyricum. As his term of governorship drew to a close, the Senate ordered Caesar to disband his army and return to Rome. In January 49 BCE, Julius Caesar led a single legion, Legio Thede, south over the Rubicon from Cisalpine Gaul to Italy. He was on his way to Rome. He deliberately broke the law on Imperium and made armed conflict inevitable by doing so. Roman historian Suetonius makes it clear that Caesar was undecided as he approached the river and attributes the crossing to a supernatural apparition. It is reported that Caesar dined with Sallust, Hirtius, Oppius, Lucius Balbus, and Sulpicus Rufus on the night after his famous crossing into Italy on 10th of January. Caesar's most trusted lieutenant in Gaul, Titus Labienus, defected from Caesar to Pompey. There are two possible reasons for this. Either Caesar hoarded military glories, or he had earlier shown loyalty to Pompey. Suetonius reports that Caesar uttered the famous phrase, the die has been cast. The phrase, crossing the Rubicon, has survived to refer to any individual or group committing itself irrevocably to a risky or revolutionary course of action, similar to the modern phrase, passing the point of no return. Caesar's decision for swift action forced Pompey, the consuls, and a large part of the Roman Senate to flee Rome. Julius Caesar's crossing of the river was the catalyst for the great Roman Civil War. Pompey abandons Rome. On 17th of January, news of Caesar's incursion into Italy reached Rome. In response, Pompey issued an edict in which he recognized a state of civil war, ordered all the senators to follow him, and declared that he would regard as a partisan of Caesar anyone who remained behind. This led his allies to leave the city along with many uncommitted senators, fearful of the bloody reprisals of previous civil wars. Other senators simply left Rome for their country villas, hoping to keep a low profile. Caesar's timing was impeccable. While Pompey's forces were vastly outnumbered by Caesar's single legion, which numbered at least 100 cohorts, or 10 legions, it was clear that Italy was not prepared to meet an invasion. Caesar captured Ariminum, modern-day Rimini, without resistance, having already infiltrated the city. He then captured three more cities in quick succession. In late January, Caesar and Pompey were negotiating. Caesar proposed that they return to their provinces, which would have required Pompey to travel to Spain, and then disband their forces. Pompey accepted those terms, provided that they withdraw from Italy at once and submit to arbitration of the dispute by the Senate. Caesar rejected this counteroffer, as it would have put him at the mercy of hostile senators while giving up all the advantages of his surprise invasion. Caesar continued to advance. After encountering five cohorts under Quintus Minucius Thermus at Eguvium, Thermus's forces deserted. Caesar swiftly overran Picanum, 
the area from which Pompey's family originated. While Caesar's troops engaged in a brief skirmish with local forces, they were fortunate to encounter a population that was not hostile. His troops refrained from looting and his opponents had little popular appeal. In February 49 BCE, Caesar received reinforcements and captured Asculum when the local garrison deserted. First Opposition, Siege of Corfinium. The Siege of Corfinium was the first significant military confrontation of Caesar's civil war. In February 49 BCE, the Popularis, led by Gaius Julius Caesar, laid siege to the Italian city of Corfinium. The Optimates, commanded by Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, held the city. The siege lasted only a week, after which the defenders surrendered themselves to Caesar. Caesar's bloodless victory was a significant propaganda coup that hastened the Optimate forces' retreat from Italia, leaving the Populares in effective control of the entire peninsula. Caesar stayed at Corfinium for seven days and then accepted the city's surrender. He immediately broke camp and set out into Apulia to pursue Pompey. Upon learning of Caesar's victory, Pompey began to march his army from Luceria to Canusium and then on to Brundisium, where he could further retreat by crossing the Adriatic Sea to Epirus. As he began his march, Caesar had six legions with him. He had immediately sent Ahenobarbus's legions under Curio to secure Sicily. They would later fight for him in Africa. Pompey was soon besieged in Brundisium by Caesar's army, but his evacuation was a success nonetheless. Caesar controls the Italian peninsula. Caesar's advance down the Adriatic coast was surprisingly disciplined. Unlike during the Social War a few decades earlier, his soldiers did not plunder the countryside. Caesar did not avenge himself on his political enemies, as Sulla and Marius had done. The policy of clemency was also highly practical. Caesar's pacificity was the key to preventing the population of Italy from turning on him. At the same time, Pompey was planning to escape east to Greece, where he would raise a massive army from the eastern provinces. He therefore made his way to Brundisium, modern Brindisi, where he seized merchant vessels to travel the Adriatic. Julius Caesar besieged the Italian city of Brundisium on the coast of the Adriatic Sea, which was held by a force of Optimates under the command of Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus. After a series of brief skirmishes, Caesar tried to blockade the harbor, but Pompey abandoned the city and managed to evacuate his men across the Adriatic to Epirus. Pompey's retreat gave Caesar full control of the Italian peninsula. He had no way to pursue Pompey's forces in the east, so he headed west to confront the legions Pompey had stationed in Hispania. On his way to Hispania, Caesar seized the opportunity to return to Rome for the first time in nine years. He wanted to make it clear that he was the legitimate representative of the Republic, so he arranged for the Senate to meet with him outside the city limits on 1st at April. Cicero was also invited, but he was not persuaded to come to Rome. He was determined not to be used and was wary of the increasingly ominous tone of the letters sent by Caesar. Siege of Massilia With Mark Antony in charge of Italy, Caesar set out west for Spain. On his way, he began a siege of Massilia when the city refused him entry and was placed under the command of Domitius Ahenobarbus. With a small bodyguard and 900 German auxiliary cavalry, Caesar left a besieging force and continued to Spain. Ahenobarbus arrived in Massilia to defend it against the Caesarian forces after the siege had begun. In late June, Caesar's ships were victorious in the ensuing naval battle, despite being less skillfully built than those of the Massiliots and outnumbered. Gaius Trebonius conducted the siege using a variety of siege machines, including siege towers, a siege ramp, and a testudo ram. Gaius Scribonius Curio was careless in adequately guarding the Sicilian Straits, allowing Lucius Nasidius to bring more ships to the aid of Ahenobarbus. He fought a second naval battle with Decimus Brutus in early September, but was soundly defeated and sailed for Hispania. At the final surrender of Massilia, Caesar showed his usual leniency, and Lucius Ahenobarbus 
fled to Thessaly in the only vessel that was able to escape from the Populares. Afterwards, Massilia was allowed to keep nominal autonomy. This was due to ancient ties of friendship and support of Rome, along with some territories. Most of its empire was confiscated by Julius Caesar. Caesar takes Spain. Battle of Alerta Caesar arrived in Hispania on 4th of June 49th BCE and seized the Pyrenees passes defended by the Pompeian Lucius Afranius and Marcus Petraeus. At Ilerda, he soundly defeated a Pompeian army under the command of legates Lucius Afranius and Marcus Petraeus. This was a campaign of maneuver, not actual fighting, unlike many of the other battles of the Civil War. After the surrender of the Republican main army in Spain, Caesar marched towards Varro in Hispania Ulterior. Varro submitted without a fight, leading to the surrender of two more legions. After this, Caesar left his legate Quintus Cassius Longinus, the brother of Gaius Cassius Longinus, in command of Spain with four of the legions. These were partly made up of men who had surrendered and gone over to the Caesarian camp. He then returned with the rest of his army to Massilia and its siege. Siege of Curicta The Siege of Curicta was a military confrontation that took place during the early stages of Caesar's civil war. In 49 BCE, a significant force of populares, commanded by Gaius Antonius, was besieged on the island of Curicta by an optimate fleet under Lucius Scribonius Libo and Marcus Octavius. This was swiftly followed by a naval defeat by Publius Cornelius Dolabella and Antonius, who eventually capitulated under prolonged siege. These two defeats were some of the most significant suffered by the populares during the Civil War. The battle was a disaster for the Caesarian cause. It was undoubtedly a significant event for Caesar, who mentions it alongside the death of Curio as one of the worst setbacks of the Civil War. Suetonius lists both the defeat of Dolabella's fleet and the legion's capitulation at Corycta as the most disastrous defeats suffered by the Popularis in the Civil War. Battle of Taroento The Battle of Taroento was a decisive naval battle fought off the coast of Taroento during Caesar's Civil War. Following a successful naval battle outside Massilia, the Caesarian fleet, commanded by Decimus Junius Brutus Albinus, came into conflict with the Massiliate fleet and a Pompeian relief fleet led by Quintus Nasidius on 31st July 49th BCE. The Caesarians prevailed despite being significantly outnumbered, allowing the siege of Massilia to continue and resulting in the city's eventual surrender. The naval victory at Taroento, meant that the siege of Massilia could continue with a naval blockade in place. Nasidius was convinced that, given the state of the Massiliot fleet, it would be prudent to lend his support to Pompey's forces in Hispania Citerior rather than continue to assist operations in Gaul. The city of Massilia was dismayed to learn of the destruction of their fleet, but they were prepared for many more months under siege. Ahenobarbus fled from Massilia soon after the defeat and managed to escape capture under cover of a violent storm. Battle of Utica In Caesar's Civil War, the Battle of Utica, 49 BCE, was fought between Julius Caesar's general Gaius Scribonius Curio and Pompeian legionaries commanded by Publius Attius Verus. The Numidian cavalry and foot soldiers sent by King Juba the Fern of Numidia supported Verus. Curio soundly defeated the Pompeians and Numidians and drove Varus back into the town of Utica. In the confusion of the battle, Curio was urged to take the town before Varus could regroup. However, he held himself back, as he did not have the means at hand to undertake an assault of the town. The next day, he began to form a contravallation of Utica. His intention was to starve the town into submission, Varus was approached by the leading citizens of the town, who begged him to surrender and spare the town the horrors of a siege. However, Varus had just learned that King Juba was on his way with a large force. He reassured them that with Juba's assistance, Curio would soon be defeated. Curio heard similar reports and abandoned the siege, making his way to the Castra Cornelia. 
False reports from Utica about Juba's strength caused him to drop his guard, leading to the Battle of the Bagratus River. The Pompeians emerged victorious in Africa, the Battle of the Bagratas. After overcoming Varus's Numidian allies in a series of skirmishes, he vanquished Varus at the Battle of Utica, forcing him to flee into the town of Utica. In the confusion of the battle, Curio was urged to take the town before Varus could regroup. However, he held himself back, as he did not have the means at hand to undertake an assault of the town. The next day, he began to form a contravallation of Utica with the intent of starving the town into submission. Varus was approached by the leading citizens of the town, who begged him to surrender and spare the town the horrors of a siege. Varus, however, had just learned that King Juba was on his way with a large force. He reassured them that with Juba's assistance, Curio would soon be defeated. Curio, aware that Juba's army was less than 23 miles from Utica, abandoned the siege and made his way to his base on the Castra Cornelia. Gaius Scribonius Curio was soundly defeated by the Pompeians under Adius Varus and King Juba the Fears of Numidia. One of Curio's legates, Gnaeus Domitius, rode up to Curio with a handful of men and urged him to flee and make it back to the camp. Curio demanded to know how he could ever face Caesar again after he had lost him his army. Turning to face the oncoming Numidians, he fought on until he was killed. Only a few soldiers managed to escape the bloodbath that followed, while the 300 cavalry that had not followed Curio into battle returned to the camp at Castra Cornelia, bearing the bad news. Caesar appointed dictator in Rome. Upon returning to Rome in December 49th BCE, Caesar left Quintus Cassius Longinus in command of Spain and had Praetor Marcus Aemilius Lepidus appoint him dictator. As dictator, he conducted elections for the consulship of 48 BCE before using the dictatorial powers to pass laws recalling from exile those condemned by Pompey's courts in 52 BCE, accepting Titus Annius Milo and restoring the political rights of the children of victims of the sullen proscriptions. He had no choice but to hold the dictatorship to avoid giving up his imperium, legions, provincia, and right to triumph while within the pomerium. He won a second term as consul in the same elections he had conducted with Publius Servilius Vatia Isauricus as his colleague. He relinquished the dictatorship after just 11 days. Caesar then set his sights on Pompey across the Adriatic. Consolidation and Eastern Campaigns Crossing the Adriatic On 4 January 48 BCE, Caesar moved seven legions, most likely below half strength, onto a small fleet he assembled and crossed the Adriatic. Caesar's opponent in the consulship of 59 BCE, Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, was in charge of defending the Adriatic for the Pompeians. Caesar's decision to sail caught Bibulus's fleet off guard. Caesar landed at Paeleste on the Epirate coast without opposition or interdiction. However, the news of the landing spread, and Bibulus's fleet mobilized quickly to prevent any further ships from crossing. This placed Caesar at a significant numerical disadvantage. After landing, Caesar set off on a night march against the town of Oricum. His army forced the surrender of the town without a fight. The Pompeian legate in command there, Lucius Manlius Torquatus, was forced by the townspeople to abandon his position. Bibulus's blockade meant that Caesar was unable to request food from Italy. The season was late autumn, so Caesar would have to wait many months to forage. Some grain ships were present at Oricum, but they escaped before Caesar's forces could capture them. He then moved on to Apollonia and forced its surrender before moving on to attack Pompey's main supply center at Dyrrhachium. Pompey's reconnaissance was able to detect Caesar's movement toward Dyrrhachium and beat him to the vital supply center. Facing Pompey's substantial forces, Caesar withdrew to his already captured settlements. Caesar called for reinforcements under Mark Antony to transit the Adriatic to support him, but they were interdicted by Bibulus's mobilized fleet. Undaunted, Caesar attempted to transit from Epirus back to Italy, but was forced back by a winter storm.
Pompey's forces were determined to starve Caesar's legions out. However, Antony was able to force a crossing around the time Bibulus died, arriving in Epirus on 10th of April with four additional legions. Antony was fortunate to escape the Pompeian fleet with minimal losses. Pompey was unable to prevent Antony's reinforcements from joining with Caesar. Battle of Dyrrhachium Caesar attempted to capture the vital Pompeian logistics hub of Dyrrhachium, but Pompey occupied it and the surrounding heights, preventing him from succeeding. In response, Caesar besieged Pompey's camp and constructed a circumvallation thereof. After months of skirmishes, Pompey broke through Caesar's fortified lines, forcing Caesar to make a strategic retreat into Thessaly. In a broader sense, the Pompeians were elated at the victory, having suffered a non-trivial defeat for the first time in the Civil War. Men like Domitius Ahenobarbus urged Pompey to bring Caesar to a decisive battle and crush him. Others urged a return to Rome and Italy to retake the capital. Pompey was adamant that committing to a pitched battle was both unwise and unnecessary. He decided on strategic patience to wait for reinforcements from Syria and to exploit Caesar's weak supply lines. The elation of victory turned into overconfidence and mutual suspicion, putting significant pressure on Pompey to provoke a final encounter with the enemy. He began to place too much trust in his forces and was influenced by overconfident officers, leading him to engage Caesar in Thessaly shortly after being reinforced from Syria. The siege of Gomphi was a brief but decisive military confrontation during Caesar's civil war. After being soundly defeated at the Battle of Dyrrhachium, the men of Gaius Julius Caesar promptly besieged the Thessalian city of Gomphi. The city fell in a few hours, and Caesar's men proceeded to sack Gomphi. Battle of Pharsalus The Battle of Pharsalus was the decisive battle of Caesar's civil war. It was fought on 9th of August 48 BCE near Pharsalus in central Greece. Julius Caesar and his allies formed up opposite the army of the Roman Republic under the command of Pompey. Pompey had the backing of the majority of Roman senators, and his army was significantly larger than the veteran Caesarian legions. Pressured by his officers, Pompey reluctantly engaged in battle and suffered an overwhelming defeat. Desperate to avoid defeat, Pompey fled with his advisors overseas to Mytilene and thence to Cilicia, where he held a council of war. Meanwhile, Cato and his supporters at Dyrrhachium attempted to hand over command to Marcus Tullius Cicero, who refused, deciding instead to return to Italy. They regrouped at Corcyra and then went to Libya. Others, including Marcus Junius Brutus, sought Caesar's pardon and traveled over marshlands to Larissa, where he was welcomed graciously by Caesar in his camp. Pompey's council of war decided to flee to Egypt where he had received military aid the previous year. After the battle, Caesar captured Pompey's camp and burned Pompey's correspondence. He then declared that he would forgive anyone who asked for mercy. The Pompeian naval forces in the Adriatic and Italy mostly withdrew or surrendered. Assassination of Pompey Caesar states that Pompey proceeded from Mytilene to Cilicia and Cyprus. He took money from the tax collectors, borrowed money to hire soldiers, and armed 2,000 men. He boarded a ship with many bronze coins. Pompey set sail from Cyprus with warships and merchant ships. He was informed that Ptolemy was in Pelusium with an army, and that he was at war with his sister Cleopatra VII, whom he had deposed. Pompey sent a messenger to announce his arrival to Ptolemy and request his aid, given that the camps of the opposing forces were close by. Pothinus the eunuch, the boy king's regent, convened a meeting with Theodotus of Chios, the king's tutor, Achilles, the head of the army, and others. Plutarch reports that some advised driving Pompey away, while others welcomed him. Theodotus was adamant that neither option was safe. If Pompey was welcomed, he would become a master and Caesar an enemy. Conversely, if he was turned away, Pompey would blame the Egyptians for rejecting him and Caesar for making him continue his pursuit. Assassinating Pompey would eliminate the fear of him and gratify Caesar. 
On 28 September, Achilles went to Pompey's ship on a fishing boat with Lucius Septimius, who had once been one of Pompey's officers and a third assassin, Savius. Pompey told Septimius he was an old comrade, but Septimius merely nodded. He thrust a sword into Pompey, and then Achilles and Savius stabbed him with daggers. Pompey's head was severed, and his unclothed body was thrown into the sea. When Caesar arrived in Egypt a few days later, he was appalled. He turned away, loathing the man who brought Pompey's head. When Caesar was given Pompey's seal ring, he cried. Theodotus left Egypt and escaped Caesar's revenge. Pompey's remains were taken to Cornelia, who gave them a proper burial at his Alban villa. Alexandrian War In October 48 BCE, Caesar arrived in Alexandria seeking Pompey, his enemy in the civil war. He found Pompey had been assassinated by Ptolemy the Thene's men. Caesar's financial demands and high-handedness then triggered a conflict which put him under siege in Alexandria's palace quarter. Only after external intervention from a Roman client state were Caesar's forces relieved. After his victory at the Battle of the Nile and Ptolemy XIII's death, Caesar installed his mistress Cleopatra as Egyptian queen, with her younger brother as co-monarch. Siege of Alexandria The Siege of Alexandria was a series of skirmishes and battles between the forces of Julius Caesar, Cleopatra VII, Arsinoe IV, and Ptolemy III between 48 and 47 BCE. At this time, Caesar was engaged in a civil war against the remaining Republican forces. The siege was lifted by relief forces arriving from Syria. After a battle to stop Ptolemy the Thede and Arsinoe's forces crossing the Nile Delta, they were defeated. Battle of Nicopolis After a decisive victory over Pompey and the Optimates at Pharsalus, Julius Caesar pursued his opponents to Asia Minor and then to Egypt. In the Roman province of Asia, he left Calvinus in command with an army including the 36th Legion, mainly made up of veterans from Pompey's disbanded legions. With Caesar preoccupied in Egypt and the Roman Republic in the midst of a civil war, Pharnaces seized the opportunity to expand his kingdom of the Bosphorus into his father's old Pontic Empire. In 48 BCE, he invaded Cappadocia, Bithynia, and Armenia Parva. Calvinus brought his army to within seven miles of Nicopolis and, avoiding an ambush set by Farnaces, deployed his army with confidence. Farnaces retired to the city and awaited a further Roman advance. Calvinus moved his army closer to Nicopolis and built another camp. Farnaces intercepted a couple of messengers from Caesar requesting reinforcements from Calvinus. He released them certain that the message would cause the Romans to either withdraw or commit to a disadvantageous battle. Calvinus ordered his men to attack, and they advanced on the enemy. The 36th soundly defeated their opponents and advanced across the trench to attack the Pontic center. Calvinus was unlucky. These were the only soldiers in his army to have any success. His recently recruited troops on the left were forced to retreat after a counterattack. Although the 36th Legion escaped with light losses, just 250 casualties, Calvinus had lost nearly two-thirds of his army by the time he had fully disengaged. Final Campaign's Battle of the Nile The Egyptians had set up camp in a strong position along the Nile and were accompanied by a fleet. Caesar arrived shortly afterwards, before Ptolemy could attack Mithridates' army. Caesar and Mithridates met seven miles from Ptolemy's position. They had to ford a small river to reach the Egyptian camp. Ptolemy sent a detachment of cavalry and light infantry to stop them from crossing the river. The Egyptians were in trouble. Caesar had sent his Gallic and Germanic cavalry to ford the river ahead of the main army. They had crossed undetected. When Caesar arrived, he had his men construct makeshift bridges across the river and ordered his army to charge the Egyptians. As they did, the Gallic and Germanic forces appeared and charged into the Egyptian flank and rear. The Egyptians broke and fled back to Ptolemy's camp, with many fleeing by boat. Caesar had now taken control of Egypt. 
he lifted the siege of Alexandria and placed Cleopatra on the throne as co-ruler with her brother, the 12-year-old Ptolemy XIV. Caesar lingered in Egypt until April, enjoying a liaison of about two months with the youthful queen before departing to resume his civil war. News of a crisis in Asia persuaded Caesar to leave Egypt in the middle of 47 BCE. At that time, sources suggest Cleopatra was already pregnant. He left behind three legions under the command of a son of one of his freedmen to secure Cleopatra's rule. Cleopatra most certainly bore a child in late June, which she called Ptolemy Caesar, and which the Alexandrians called Caesarian. Caesar was certain that the child was his, as he allowed the name to be used. Veni, Vidi, Vici, Battle of Zella. After the Ptolemaic forces were soundly defeated at the Battle of the Nile, Caesar left Egypt and set off through Syria, Cilicia, and Cappadocia to fight Pharnaces, son of Mithridates VI. Pharnaces' army marched down into the valley, separating the two armies. Caesar was perplexed by this move, as it meant his opponents had to fight an uphill battle. Pharnaces' men climbed up from the valley and engaged Caesar's thin line of legionaries. F. Caesar ordered the rest of his men to stop building their camp and quickly formed them into a battle line. Meanwhile, Pharnaces' scythed chariots broke through the thin defensive line, but were met by a hail of missiles, Pila, the Roman throwing spear, from Caesar's battle line, and were forced to retreat. Caesar launched a counterattack and drove the Pontic army back down the hill, where it was completely routed. Caesar then stormed and took Pharnaces' camp, completing his victory. This was a pivotal moment in Caesar's military career. His five-hour campaign against Pharnaces was swift and decisive, and Plutarch, writing about 150 years after the battle, reports that he commemorated it with the now-famous Latin words reportedly written to Amantius in Rome, Veni, Vidi, Vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. Suetonius states that the same three words were displayed prominently in the triumph for the victory at Zela. Pharnaces escaped from Zela, first fleeing to Sinope and then back to his Bosporan kingdom. He began to recruit another army, but was swiftly defeated and killed by his son-in-law, Asander, one of his former governors, who had revolted after the Battle of Nicopolis. Caesar made Mithridates of Pergamum, the new king of the Bosporian kingdom, in recognition of his invaluable aid during the Egyptian campaign. Caesar's African campaign, Caesar ordered his men to gather in Lilybaeum on Sicily in late December. He placed a minor member of the Scipio family, one Scipio Salvito or Saluccio, on this staff because he was certain that no Scipio could be defeated in Africa. He assembled six legions there and set out for Africa on 25 of December 47 BCE. The storm and strong winds disrupted the transit, and only around 3,500 legionaries and 150 cavalry landed with him near the enemy port of Hadramentum. It is said that when landing, Caesar fell onto the beach but was able to laugh off the bad omen when he grabbed two handfuls of sand and declared, I have hold of you, Africa. Battle off Cartea Caesar's forces won a minor naval battle off Cartea during the latter stages of the Civil War. Led by Caesar's legate Gaius Didius, the Caesarians defeated the Pompeians, led by Publius Attius Varus. Varus would then join the rest of the Pompeians at Munda to meet Caesar. Despite fierce resistance, the Pompeians were soundly defeated by Caesar, with both Labienus and Varus killed. Battle of Respina Titus Labienus commanded the Optimate force and deployed his 8,000 Numidian cavalry and 1,600 Gallic and Germanic cavalry in unusually close and dense formations for cavalry. The deployment succeeded in misleading Caesar, who believed them to be close-order infantry. Caesar deployed his army in a single extended line to prevent an envelopment. He positioned his small force of 150 archers at the front and the 400 cavalry on the wings. 
In a bold move, Labienus extended his cavalry on both flanks to envelop Caesar, bringing up his Numidian light infantry in the center. The Numidian light infantry and cavalry began to wear down the Caesarian legionaries with javelins and arrows. This was an extremely effective tactic, as the legionaries were unable to retaliate. The Numidians simply withdrew to a safe distance and continued launching projectiles. The Numidian cavalry routed Caesar's cavalry and succeeded in surrounding his legions, who redeployed into a circle to face attacks from all sides. The Numidian light infantry launched a barrage of missiles at the legionaries. Caesar's legionaries threw their pila at the enemy, but they were ineffective. The Roman soldiers, nervous and unsure of themselves, bunched up together, making themselves easy targets for the Numidian missiles. Titus Labienus rode up to the front rank of Caesar's troops, coming very close to taunt the enemy troops. A veteran of the 10th Legion approached Labienus, who recognized him immediately. The veteran threw his pilum at Labienus's horse, killing it. That'll teach you, Labienus, the veteran growled, shaming him in front of his own men. A soldier of the 10th is attacking you. Some men began to panic. An Aquilifer tried to escape, but Caesar grabbed him, spun him around, and shouted, The enemy is over there! Caesar ordered the battle line to be as long as possible and every second cohort to turn around. This meant that the standards would be facing the Numidian cavalry in the Romans' rear and the other cohorts would face the Numidian light infantry in front. The legionaries charged and threw their pila, scattering the Optimates' infantry and cavalry. They pursued their enemy for a short distance and then began to march back to camp. However, Marcus Petrius and Gnaeus Calpurnius Piso arrived with 1,600 Numidian cavalry and a large number of light infantry who harassed Caesar's legionaries as they retreated. Caesar redeployed his army for combat and launched a counterattack, forcing the Optimates' forces back over high ground. At this point, Petraeus was wounded. Both armies were completely exhausted and withdrew back to their camps. Battle of Thapsus. The forces of the Optimates, led by Quintus Caecilius Metellus Scipio, were decisively defeated by the veterans loyal to Julius Caesar. This was soon followed by the suicides of Scipio and his ally Cato the Younger, the Numidian king Juba, his Roman peer Marcus Petraeus, and the surrender of Cicero and others who accepted Caesar's pardon. The battle preceded peace in Africa. Caesar withdrew and returned to Rome on 25th of July that year. Caesar's opposition was not over, however. Titus Labienus, Pompey's sons, Varus, and several others managed to gather another army at Baetica in Hispania Ulterior. The civil war was not over, and the Battle of Munda would soon follow. The Battle of Thapsus is generally regarded as the last large-scale use of war elephants in the West. Second Spanish Campaign On his return to Rome, Caesar celebrated four triumphs over Gaul, Egypt, Asia, and Africa. However, in November 46 BC, Caesar left for Spain to crush the opposition there. His appointment of Quintus Cassius Longinus after his first campaign in Spain had led to a rebellion. Cassius's greed and unpleasant temper led to many provincials and troops openly declaring their allegiance to the Pompeian cause, some of them rallied by Pompey's sons, Gnaeus and Sextus. The Pompeians were joined there by other refugees from Thapsus, including Labienus. After receiving bad news from the peninsula, he left with a single experienced legion, as many of his veterans had been discharged, and left Italy in the hands of his new magister Equitum Lepidus. He led a total of eight legions, which raised fears that he might be defeated by Gnaeus Pompey's formidable force of over 13 legions and other auxiliaries. The Spanish campaign was full of atrocities, as Caesar treated his enemies as rebels, his men decorated their fortifications with severed heads and massacred enemy soldiers. Caesar first arrived in Spain and relieved the siege of Iulia. He then marched against Corduba, garrisoned by Sextus Pompey, who asked his brother Gnaeus for reinforcements. Gnaeus, on the advice of Labienus, initially refused to fight, 
forcing Caesar into a winter siege of the city, which was eventually called off after little progress. Caesar then moved to besiege Ategua, shadowed by Gnaeus's army. However, significant desertions began to take their toll on the Pompeian forces. Ategua surrendered on 19th of February 45 BC, even after its Pompeian commander massacred suspected defectors and their families on the walls. Gnaeus Pompey's forces then withdrew from Ategua, followed by Caesar. Battle of Munda The Battle of Munda, 17th of March 45 BC, in southern Hispania Ulterior, was the final battle of Caesar's civil war against the leaders of the Optimates. With the military victory at Munda and the deaths of Titus Labienus and Gnaeus Pompeius, Pompey's eldest son, Caesar was politically able to return to Rome in triumph and rule as the elected Roman dictator. The assassination of Julius Caesar then began the decline of the Republic, leading to the Roman Empire, which began with the reign of the Emperor Augustus. Caesar left his legate Quintus Fabius Maximus to besiege Munda and set out to pacify the province. Cordoba surrendered. The armed men in the city, mostly armed slaves, were executed and the city was forced to pay a heavy indemnity. The city of Munda held out for some time, but after an unsuccessful attempt to break the siege, surrendered, taking 14,000 prisoners. Gaius Didius, a naval commander loyal to Caesar, hunted down most of the Pompeian ships. Gnaeus Pompeius sought refuge on land, but was cornered and killed at the Battle of Lauro. Although Sextus Pompeius remained at large, after Munda there were no more conservative armies to challenge Caesar's rule. On his return to Rome, according to Plutarch, the triumph he celebrated for this victory displeased the Romans beyond all measure for he had not defeated foreign generals or barbarian kings, but had destroyed the children and family of one of Rome's greatest men. Caesar was made dictator for life, but his success was short-lived. Battle of Lauro The Battle of Lauro, 45 BC, was the last stand of Gnaeus Pompeius the Younger, son of Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, against the supporters of Julius Caesar during the Civil War of 49 to 45 BC. After being defeated at the Battle of Munda, the younger Pompeius tried unsuccessfully to flee Hispania Ulterior by sea, but was eventually forced to land. Pursued by Caesar's forces under Lucius Cassenius Lento, the Pompeians were cornered on a wooded hill near the town of Lauro, where most of them, including Pompeius the Younger, were killed in battle. Epilogue Caesar's appointment to dictatorship during the Civil War, first temporarily and then permanently in early 44 BC, together with his de facto and probably indefinite semi-divine monarchical rule, led to a conspiracy which succeeded in assassinating him on the Ides of March 44 BC, three days before Caesar was to travel east to Parthia. The conspirators included many Caesarian officers who had served with distinction during the civil wars, as well as men who had been pardoned by Caesar. We offer you deep historical information from history on YouTube channel. Subscribe. Now don't forget to turn on notifications.